we are still in the middle of a devastating situation when it comes to climate change. And all of you are at the coalface. You're at the forefront of the impact and effects. I'd like to cast our minds back to a pledge that was made over a decade ago that richer and wealthier nations that are industrialized would be spending over $100 billion in investing in smaller and developing economies to help with the energy transition. And the question is, has that been done? We know that after COP, we realized that a lot of the money that was put on the table never really materialized. So I'd like to start with you, Your Excellency. Um, Seychelles has been very vocal about the impacts, about what this means for your future. And I want you to give me an idea of where we stand today. You know, after Glasgow, lots of pledges and lots of things being sort of signed. Are you seeing anything moving the needle right now? Thank you very much. Uh, the answer is no. We are still living in, uh, in high hopes that uh, the pledges will be, will be accomplished. But unfortunately, well, we had Paris, then uh, Glasgow, and uh, the commitments uh, keep being reinforced, but uh, unfortunately, the results are not forthcoming. And uh, it is very important to note that uh, as a small island developing state, or as an oceanic state, we depend on others to help us. And uh, one, of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons being that uh, when you're talking of climate change, we are not, uh, we are not uh, really damaging the planet. Yeah. On the contrary, our emissions are low, and uh, it's, uh, it's the industrialized nations that are doing all the harm. But on the other hand, we find ourselves mitigating the climate change. We find ourselves giving, and uh, it's always giving, but, uh, but when it's time to receive in order to protect our very, to protect ourselves, and when we say protection, we mean our very survival. I mean, the masses that are being destroyed, the islands that, are, that will soon no longer be. So we, we are a bit disappointed to say, to put it mildly, very disappointed to put it uh, the way it should be said, that uh, the commitments are not... Are you uh, angry? Under... Are you angry that you're not oh, seeing that commitment on the table? Ov obviously, the anger, the anger is there because... Uh, <laughs> With all the with all the the talk, with all the 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 loud speeches and uh, and everything else, but when you compare the reality, yeah, it's it's a totally different story. Prime Minister Brown, you have said that COP is just a PR exercise and it doesn't really amount to anything uh, on the ground. Um, and I mentioned this, I alluded to this in the intro that we had a red alert. We know that we're we're in trouble. And yet now we again are sitting with another crisis, uh, other crises that could divert attention. Do you think we're going to take our eye off the ball here? Well, we have to remain resolute that climate change, which is the most significant existential threat facing the planet, that it remains at the forefront and that we continue to advocate for the phasing out of fossil fuels and for us to reduce global temperatures below 1.5 degrees in order to protect human civilization. There is no other priority. In fact, on the current trajectory, we are literally facing a situation in which global temperatures could rise to about 2.7 degrees. And at that point, we could lose a significant portion of our biodiversity and human civilization globally would be impacted. Unfortunately, small island states like Antigua and Barbuda, the Seychelles, and certainly Maldives and others, uh, we are on the front lines. So we'll be the first to go, but certainly others will follow. So notwithstanding the current instability, the situation with um, petroleum shortages and so, and so on, we have to remain uh, very resolute in our ambition to cut emissions and to control global temperatures in order not to imperil human civilization. Minister Shana, we have spoken before, and we actually spoke ahead of Glasgow last year. Um, we're, we're heading to COP in Egypt, and we're hoping to see again some kind of commitment. Um, some people are feeling very disheartened in terms of what we're going to be facing in the next year, in terms of 
global instability. We have heard the energy security issue could mean that Europe might need to fire up old coal-fired power plants. Yet it's accelerating the move towards renewables, which will take some time. How are you reading into the situation? Uh, thank you for having um, the frontline states in, in, a, in a conference such as us. The Maldives, Seychelles, Antigua and Barbuda, we are all frontline states. And just months after COP26, where we made incremental progress, we saw the report by the IPCC, AR6 was released, and unfortunately it did not get the attention it deserved. And it very clearly states that unless we are able to keep global temperatures within 1.5, countries like the Seychelles, Antigua and Barbuda, the Maldives, we are going to find it extremely challenging to continue to live in our island nations. We are very large ocean states, and even in the Maldives, we have observed at least about 4.5 inches of sea level rise. We have observed 1.1 degrees of temperature increases in the Maldives. Our survival, our food, our revenue, all depends on ocean resources. If we continue to emit as business as usual, we might, it, it's not just us, we are all in this together. It's not just small island states, but Europe is already experiencing yeah extreme weather events, floods, and they will continue to experience these changes as well. But we are frontline states, so see us as just the first wave of the impacts of it, but it's coming to everyone, all of us. And I have to say, you know, when we look at, for example, Africa that still desperately needs to industrialize and it's sitting with a very bad dilemma of having availability of fossil fuels, for example, and yet being put into sort of the same category as everyone else in the world, well, we all have to drop emissions by a certain percentage. Prime Minister, do you think that the, the richer countries, the countries that have fossil fuels that have industrialized for a long time, should be reducing emissions far more aggressively and still allowing economic development for the countries that need it most? Or do you think we're all in this together, we all have to be aggressive? There, there is no room to play around with. Well, you know, this threat is so significant that it requires an all of society approach. And it requires the commitment of all countries, large and small, especially the industrialized countries to reduce the emissions and to help developing countries to transition away from the use of fossil fuel energy and to adopt the new green energy technologies. Uh, this is important ultimately to protect human civilization. And I believe too that there are some who are put in let's say, livelihoods ahead of protecting lives. Now, clearly, if we're not alive, then we'll not be able to protect um, the economy. So putting the economy ahead of the, li or the lives of individuals, I think that the priority is wrong and that ultimately we must understand the threat of climate change, that it represents the most significant threat to humanity and it must be given significant priority. All the necessary resources should be made available to ensure that the transition could take place in an ordinary manner. And we're not suggesting that we just transition overnight into fossil fuels, so into green energy from fossil fuels. We recognize it will take time, but what is required at this point is greater commitment. And we need to have a situation in which we put our common humanity above economies. Shana, uh, Minister Shana, why do you think we haven't seen this commitment materialize into action and implementation by the wealthier nations? Well, developed countries need to take action on the commitments they've made. And I think that's the smartest way to do it as well. And today we are here discussing at the World Government Summit what the future of the world should be. And this is the defining issue of our times. And we are the, large, we are the generation to be able to address this issue as well. If we think that we can depend and continue to depend on fossil fuels to build our economies, it's very wrong. That's not the right way to do it. Today, we are here as leaders to make the right decisions, not the convenient ones. Uh, Prime Minister, um, when you hear the Total CEO saying, we understand we're in an energy insecurity situation with supply constraints that are emerging from oil and gas, specifically out of Russia. Um, 
And and then we hear, well, if you want us to help with the supply constraints, we need 20-year commitment in investment so that we know that we're secure in our investments, right? And we can help with the energy transition, but we need to be more realistic about what the next 20 years mean because people have shareholder responsibilities. What did you think of that? Well, we know that the next decade is a critical decade to get it right. And I cannot see us conscionably agreeing to any significant new investments in fossil fuel energy, because in essence, uh, it will result in significant warming of the planet. And as I said before, it will imperil human civilization. Now, I understand the urgency to increase um, energy supplies. I understand increase in pricing. But at the same time, I'm quite sure that the industrialized nations, that they have the capacity to further subsidize uh, fossil fuels in the interim to drive down prices, not necessarily to, to um, subsidize it to sustain the production of um, fossil fuels, because ultimately, fossil fuel energy should stay in the ground. That is where it belongs. And for you, Mr. President, do you think um, the commitments that we've seen from oil producing nations about decarbonization and transition, do you think they're committed? This, they say they are committed, but uh, the reality presents another picture. And uh, here again, we, we go back to COP26, the commitments that have been made and, uh, and what uh, we as small island developing states are experiencing. You see, again, when we put things in context, and, uh, and here I'm talking about the, about the African continent, the total emission from, uh, from the whole of Africa is only 5%. And uh, when other countries are saying they're going to reduce their emissions by 5% or whatever percentage, we are not even producing what they will reduce. So this is where we need this serious conversation. And we've been talking this morning about a new world order. So this is also part of the, part of the conversation. This new world order is not just about, about whether there'll be more wars or, or what type of currency we'll be using. As Prime Minister has just said, Prime Minister Brown, we may, be, we may be talking about all these grand ideas, but if at the end of the day, the one planet that we have, planet A, which is planet Earth, is destroyed, then what is left for us? Let me ask you this. I mean, you're talking about a new economic world order, a shift in powers. We don't know how this, this crisis in Eastern Ukraine is going to play out. Do you think that climate will still be on the agenda in a rejigging of the world order? Well, it should be. And, and here may I but say... But will it be? Because then we're thinking about well, East, South, East, East, East cooperation, Global South and East, well, China. The, you see, these are the questions that we ask ourselves because we are the less powerful and when the powerful talk, it's a different story. And um, I can even use an example. We're talking about the, the commitment. The commitments made in Paris, in, uh, in Scotland. And these commitments are not forthcoming. But uh, when we look at what has been happening since the war in Ukraine, when the billions are, are pouring so and there's money, right? It's yes, there is the money. There is <laughs> really? the money, but really? it's being used yeah. for their own personal priorities, interests. And this is where we are talking about our, our survival, our disappearance. I mean, uh, I, I was, uh, well, some years back, the prime minister of uh, the president of uh, the Maldives had an underwater cabinet meeting and every, the whole world was, was impressed. But this is what is, will happen to us. We are already seeing our islands disappear. That's the reality we are facing, the coastal erosion. What is today uh, a little hill will soon, be, will, soon be part of the, will soon be part of the coast. This is what we want the world to, talk, to, to, to understand. We are talking about the, our very survival, and it's not just our little survival in the various corners of the world where we are, we're talking about the survival of planet Earth. 
So let's talk about the money that could be flowing to small island developing nations, right? And let's talk about the reparations that, you know, many um, developing economies has been calling for. Would the argument be, and I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, there aren't investable projects, for example, or money needs to find a home and it's not that easy to invest. How quickly can we put that money to work, right? Because the money hasn't been flowing. What, what are the arguments against, you know, funding this problem immediately? Yeah, well, that's for me. Thank you. <laughs> the issue of um, funding, um, that has been a very vexing issue. As you know, um, several years ago, the industrialized countries have pledged up to 100 billion US dollars a year. They have fallen short. Uh, but in any event, uh, we're quite sure that they have the resources um, to meet the 100 billion and even to exceed it. But what is important is to have this uh, money flow into the new green energy technologies in order to drive down the cost of those um, technologies so that there can be greater diffusion of the technology, especially uh, within developing countries, especially um, small states. And by so doing, that will help to accelerate our transition into these um, green energy applications, which have currently, they, they have proven to be uh, cost prohibitive. I mean, even for example, electric cars. Uh, electric cars are still very cost prohibitive. And what you find is happening within the developing um, world is that um, industrialized countries are now dumping their fossil fuel vehicles on developing um, countries and thereby exacerbating the problem. When indeed, you know, these um, developed countries, they have an obligation to assist uh, developing countries globally, especially SIDS that are on the front lines of um, climate change and SIDS that do not contribute much to climate change. In fact, we have the view too that um, the whole concept that the polluter should pay uh, should be utilized to hold these um, uh, large polluting countries So, so when you come up with these ideas and you have them with, you know, the, the policymakers from richer nations and you, you say this is what we could get assistance with, do they say yes? Let's do it, Prime Minister. I, I missed it. Sorry. Do they do they agree with you when you say come? Oh, you know they always these long negotiations at these various cops. We had what uh, COP twenty six now going to twenty seven, and I'm sure there'll be twenty eight, twenty nine who will still be talking on the same issues. On the <laughs> same issues. Shana, <laughs> jump in here for me. <laughs> the, 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 the a big problem that we face um, with regards to climate finance, and I think also. Particularly that's important for us as um, small island states is there's very little that's been invested in adaptation. Most of the climate finance has flown into mitigation and investing in energy sector. And I think the reason is, or at least the reason that we've been told is that there's a business case for mitigation and there's not a business case for adaptation. But I will say that there is a business case for if all of our countries will have to relocate because of the impacts of climate change, there will be a much larger crisis than what we are seeing in, in Europe or even in other countries because of conflict. This is going to be an issue that is going to keep uh, rising and I, I, that's what I fear. I don't want to look, relocate 500,000 people of the Maldives because we do not want to be climate refugees. We want to live in the Maldives, we want to continue to live in seashells, we want to be able to build our lives in Antigua and Barbuda And as we well. want to holiday in your, uh, on your <laughs> islands as well, importantly, right? Um, okay, so we've, we've got to wrap things up. I, I've been hearing nervous laughs from all of you since we had a discussion behind uh, the stage and here. And I, I get the sense that you know, when you're having these conversations with richer nations, they're telling you one thing and they're doing another. And it's almost embarrassing them. You know, it's, it is embarrassing to think that the pledges that are put on the table, they never, you know, you no one's taking them seriously. You're not taking these pledges seriously because nothing, it, nothing comes of it. What more can you say and do for richer nations, the, the big industrialized economies to finally act? May I just say, Let's cut out the hypocrisy, let's be serious, and let's be totally engaged in what, uh, in, in, in what we pledge. Would you prefer the honesty and them saying, we're not going to do this? Yes. We're it, not interested? It, it would be better if, if uh, the honesty came out, instead of just uh, pushing everything for day after tomorrow and next week and, and the following month. And not only that, 
but also when it comes to sitting down to negotiating things, I mean, to have consultants and uh, and uh, other other arrangements which simply complicate matters. I think the whole the whole uh, way finance is managed is also a problem. We get the impression sometimes that we don't know anything. It's only the richer countries that know everything, and therefore we have to wait. And waiting is bad for the planet. And, uh, yeah. Minister Shana. Um, I, I agree with uh, the president as well. Um, I think for us small island states, it's been one cop after the other. And we don't want to continue to go to these international forums to beg for money. We know what we need to do in our countries. And we are already using our own government funds from revenue generated from our countries to invest in adaptation as well and in uh, mitigation. But we did not cause the climate crisis. And we are at the forefront of it. But we are not going to always talk about um, the impacts of us what's happening. We will continue to be leaders in the climate debate. We will continue to do whatever we can. And I think small island states are doing much more than the larger states. The Maldives is committed to reaching net zero by 2030. We are phasing now single-use plastics by 2023. We are investing in adaptation. Uh, at least, at, I think at, at least about 35%, at most 50% of our own government budget um, on adaptation. So we are doing it. And I think um, if the small countries like ours can do it, there's no reason why so everyone countries... else can. Prime Minister, last word. Well, you know, I think that we must continue our global advocacy and even at a national level to hold our policymakers accountable uh, to also educate um, our respective populations on the threat associated with climate change so that they can hold their policymakers accountable. I'm also of the view too that uh, we should not rely on these um, pleasures, which almost invariably uh, end up being um, unfulfilled, unfulfilled pledges, but we should also hold um, these large polluting countries legally responsible. In other words, we must pursue these um, countries under the various um, conventions, international conventions, and I, we we'll just add here that Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu have actually started a SIDS Commission on Climate Change and International Law, in which we are now seeking to pursue these large polluters under the ITLAS to hold them accountable. And the principle here is that the polluter must pay. Unless you have that type of legal liability arising from the profligate use of fossil fuels so that these large industrialized countries that they are caused to or call upon to pay to settle where there's loss and damage, then I believe that it will continue to game the system and that we will have cop after cop after cop without any real results. Thank you so very much for your insights and your honesty. And we wish you all the best. And thank you very much for being pioneers in this space and for uh, keeping it, you know, in the conversation, in the dialogue, and hopefully that's going to turn into action very soon. I wish you all the best. Thank you, thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Round of applause for my panelists.